Something's wrong with that kid. Gavin His head don't work, it never did. You better not cross his path. He's a chain smoking alcoholic sociopath. Step right up. Come one, come all. Everyone's a winner. Uh what a beautiful morning. Do glistening on the dumpsters as the smell. Stupendous. Ach, du Liebe. Kevin, I've been thinking of your brief marriage to the prostitute when you were 16, as well as the relationship you had with your mother growing up. I think that if we further explore the root of your discomfort and awkwardness in dealing with women, we might better be able to steer you down the road of self-recovery. Ow! Bad thing, Kevin! Bad thing! Don't make me call the guards! Kevin backed off because lately the guards have been using mace. The old-fashioned kind. Okay, Kevin. Can you tell me a little about some of your initial experience with girls? Kevin was 13 years old, and he'd just been invited to his first birthday party. There were going to be some girls there, and he was pretty nervous. He'd overheard some kids at school who said it was going to be a makeout party. Kevin wasn't sure what making out was, so he figured he'd better ask his mom and dad before he went so he wouldn't look like a moron in front of all the other kids. <laughs> Kevin waited until his dad had to reload before he asked him how to make out. Kevin's dad wasn't sure what to say. This was the first of the boy's formative life experiences that he hadn't slept through. He decided to give Kevin the loving guidance of his years of experience. First you go downtown and pick a hooker. Then you do it. But make sure you do it before you pay. Otherwise, she'll just call her pimp and have him work you over a bit and rip you off. That's how your Uncle Phil got the big scar on his head. Kevin asked what you should do if the girl you were going to make out with wasn't a prostitute. Helps to get her loaded. Just don't pick a girl who holds her booze like your old lady. Otherwise, it'll end up costing you way more than a hooker. And since most hookers is better looking, that's a bum deal. Kevin asked his dad if he'd ever been in love. I think I loved your old lady once. Whenever I heard that sloshing sound when she danced, it brought a lump to my throat. Oh, baby. The lump Percy was talking about was when his mom socked him a real sweet one in the larynx for stiffing her with the bar tab. Kevin thought that maybe his mom might have better advice about girls. But he didn't know where she was and had to wait for his dad to empty his clip to ask. She's passed out in the back seat of the car. I'm surprised she ain't woke up yet. Let me pump a few rounds in to shake her out of it. <gasps> Where the Christ am I? How's about making mama some dinner too? Thanks, boy. Mum had slept off most of her afternoon booze and hadn't really gotten started on her evening booze. So she was still pretty sober. Mommy just drinks because it helps her forget her family. Kevin figured now was as good a time as any to ask her how to make out with a girl and be romantic. Who is it? Special delivery. I really like the flower arrangement, but I'd love to check out your gift basket. Kevin asked his mother what this had to do with romance. Didn't you see him give her the flowers? And look, he's helping us stand on the rocking chair. Then he asked his mother what she considered romantic. Me? I like to get real tanked up. 
and close my eyes and pretend it's not your father, because he's not very good at it. I think of someone sexier. Oh, oh. Kevin thought that Mum was jumping the gun a little because she was talking about going all the way. So he asked her how he should act on a first date. I pretty much gone all the way on every date I ever had. Even sometimes when it wasn't a date. You know, like when you want something you ain't got money for. But don't go too quick and put a coat down so as you don't wreck the car seats. Kevin was pretty sure that what his mom and dad were telling him was wrong. So he figured he'd just wing it and use common sense. It never occurred to Kevin that if he had any common sense, he never would have bothered asking his parents about sex in the first place. Kevin's stomach was full of butterflies and cough syrup. He was hoping the cough syrup would make him more confident, but it didn't seem to be working. So he switched to rye and had a few smokes just to take the edge off. All the other kids going to the party looked really cool and popular. Hi, you must be one of David's friends. All the other kids are down in the rec room. David's dad was real nice because he was a recovering cross-addicted substance abuser who acknowledged a higher power and accepted life's obstacles. This is a no-smoking house, you little freak. Kevin didn't much like David's mom. He figured she could benefit from a good kick in the ass. Tell her to kick your ass, boy. Kevin decided he'd shake their hands and act polite instead so they wouldn't think he was an ignorant idiot. Kevin really wanted to make a good impression but he must have been a whole lot drunker than he thought, because when he stuck out his hand, he just kept going and fell right off the porch. All the kids sure looked like they were having fun dancing. Kevin really wanted to join in, but he was pretty sure things wouldn't work out the way they did in his head. So he just stood in the corner drinking. That was the kind of thing that made a lot of sense to Kevin. Kevin didn't like to do a lot of things without smoking, especially drinking. So he figured he'd sneak into the laundry room and have a few. When Kevin came back out, the music had stopped and everyone was sitting in a circle around a bottle. When Kevin asked how you played, all the girls giggled and some of them pointed at him. Kevin figured he'd better laugh along with them so they wouldn't think he was mentally retarded. All you do is spin the bottle. When it stops spinning, you have to kiss whoever it's pointing at. Kevin hoped his spin didn't point at Marty Graham, mostly because he didn't have a real good handle on the rules of the game. Marty secretly wished Kevin would spin the bottle towards him, mostly for reasons he wouldn't come to terms with until his late 20s. Kevin thought his first kiss had gone pretty well. It was his turn to spin the bottle, but before he could... From now on, the two people have to go in the closet together for five whole minutes. Kevin didn't like closets, because he had to sleep in one for five years when he was a kid, because his parents had rented out his room to some prostitutes. But he figured he'd smile and nod his head so all his new friends wouldn't think he wasn't cool. Kevin remembered what David's mom had said, and he was pretty nervous. He didn't know how to make the first move. If you try and French kiss me, I'm gonna scream. Kevin took a good luck drag off his smoke and went for it. He kissed her right on the mouth. 
Then something strange happened in his pants, and he got really scared. Kevin wasn't sure what to do, so he ran out of the closet right quick. Spencer's afraid of girls. I bet he's never even kissed a girl before. He liked boys, I bet. Kevin is a boy liker. Kevin is a boy liker. All the kids joined in and made fun of Kevin. Then David told him that they'd only invited him as a prank. Kevin was pretty cheesed off. He didn't much like being made fun of in front of the girl he loved and was going to marry. David told Kevin to drag his sorry loser ass home. The walk up the stairs was the longest walk of Kevin's life. Learn them son of a bitches some manners, boy. You ain't gotta take that. Kevin thought Alan made pretty good sense. So before he left, he stole $80 from the dresser drawer in David's parents' bedroom, and he took all the frozen meat out of the freezer and set the kitchen curtains on fire. Considering he'd already spiked the party punch with his cough syrup, he figured that ought to straighten things out. That's good effing meat, boy. Too bad you ain't never been that good a provider. Put a lid on it, Porky. Shut your goddamn face, you stupid bastard. Kiss my ass, you ugly slob. <laughs> Mr. Franklin and Warden Rifkin thought it would do Kevin some good to learn a trade. Kevin didn't figure it made a whole lot of sense. Since he was doing life, and because if he ever did get out, he was pretty sure no one would give him a job anyway, because he was an alcoholic sociopath who liked to steal things. All the prison officials were worried, because they didn't want Kevin doing anything that involved tools or machinery. They'd all learned the hard way to keep sharp things and blunt instruments out of Kevin's reach. About the only job that left for Kevin was working as the prison librarian. That ain't no job for a man. I hear your boy's working in the library. He ain't fruity. You find most of your librarians is women. You'd best think about straightening out your boy, Percy. Percy tried to defend his son as best he could. But the only book he'd ever seen is the one the police threw at him before locking his white trash ass away. Uncle Phil was doing time for robbing the orphans fund, and even he figured Kevin was giving the Spencers a bad name. He ain't never had no girlfriend, so it might just be that he is. His head just broke it all. He don't know no better. It's your job to teach him. Keep your effing nose the hell out of my family business. Punch him in the face, Percy! Jesus, I think he's dead. Let's get out of here. Kevin thought being a librarian was a pretty easy job especially since he didn't give a damn about putting books back where they were supposed to go or keeping track of who took a book out. And besides, Kevin had decided that reading would be his new favorite hobby, at least for a while. Remember your life garden, Kevin? Let's continue planting the happy seeds. The only happy seeds Kevin knew were the ones the guards found in Uncle Mike's ashtrays while crossing the Mexican border. I'd like to talk about your mother today. She seemed to be a yin and yang personality. Uh, one moment cold and uncaring, the next moment overcome with mothering instinct and emotion spurned by guilt. Now, uh, are there any particular instances where her desire to be a good mother had a negative impact on your id? Hey, what month is it anyway? I'm wearing my yellow jockey, so it must be August. You don't own yellow jockeys. I do now. The boy's got school coming. Great, when he's gone, we can have the nooners in the kitchen, just like the old days. Oh. <laughs> Come here, baby. Come and see Mama. Bring me that bottle on your way. You and me, we's gonna have a family mother and Sunday. I'm gonna take the boy to get school clothes. We ain't got no money for clothes. 
Mama won bingo last night. We're sitting sweet, baby. Then bring home some takeout and smoke. Don't look at nothing what ain't on the sales rack, cause you ain't getting it. Nah, two parole officer-ish. Nah, looks like you followed your pants or something. Oh God, no, that's way too fruity. Jesus Lord, you look like a little freak. Hey everybody, look how dumb my boy looks. <laughs> Kevin didn't much like shopping for school clothes. He liked it even less when a bunch of his classmates walked in and saw him. Everyone pointed and laughed. Kevin thought that was unfair, so he took one of the kids from school aside and explained how he felt to him. Kevin was pretty sure none of the kids would ever laugh at him again. Oh yeah, he'll wear it home. Wait till the old man sees this. He'll piss himself laughing. Come on, boy. Hey, look at my boy's clothes. Funny, ain't they? Kevin had hoped Alan would step in and help him out, but his imaginary friend wasn't of much use. <laughs> Don't he look dumb? Sing us a song, Shirley Temple. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you forgot to take out and smokes. I ain't your slave, you dumb slob. Up yours, cow. <laughs> My head. Ain't nothing wrong with my head. I sense a great deal of hostility towards me. Is it because you view me as the enemy? Or perhaps because you feel a little frightened by doctors and the assumed authority of the position and somehow feel threatened which creates a fear which in turn manifests itself in outward verbalizations of hostility. Kevin's dad didn't know what the hell Mr. Franklin was talking about. But just in case it was a threat or a come on, the old man figured he'd drift him a real sweet one in the neck with his coffee cup, just to make sure. The apple sure doesn't fall far from the tree now, does it? I thought you was getting fruity on me. Uh, no, I mean your son's violent reflexive responses to authority are similar to yours. Apples give me diarrhea. I'd like to discuss your own fears on the impact they had on Kevin. Percy knew he was a bad parent and didn't want to talk about it with Mr. Franklin. Once he played hide and seek with Kevin, and while the boy was counting, he packed up and moved 300 miles away. I would also like you to stop burning holes in my couch with your cigarette. And now about your fears of Kevin growing up as, as you put it, fruity. Kevin's dad was worried his boy might go fruity because the old lady kept taking him to the mall clothes shopping. So he decided to take the boy away from drinking and smoking in front of the TV and instill some manly virtues in him by teaching him how to drink and smoke by a lake. The first rule of fishing is always push the car down the block before you start it. So your lard ass old lady don't wake up and make you for cleaning out her purse. Okay, boy, go through all the garages that ain't locked until you find us some fishing poles. Don't be shy about taking booze if you find any. Daddy will wait here. Go, boy, go! Finally, Kevin found something he was sure the old man would like. A boat. Could I find in this boat, boy? God's ashtray. Hump this cooler down to the lake, then go find some damn worms. I gotta take a leak.
This ain't working worth crap. You wait here, boy. I got an idea. Why don't you drink faster so you and me can take a little fun ride in your fractured head? Kevin figured that would be a whole lot more fun than fishing, so he banged back a few quick ones of gin and threw in some cough syrup just to smooth out the edges. Kevin figured that ought to straighten things out. into it. Lucky for you, you didn't touch daddy's rye. Here, grab a stick. You and me is gonna learn them son of a bitch fish a thing or two about sportsmanship. Now haul that boat in the water. Kevin's dad was so stewed, he stood up in the boat, dropped a lit stick of dynamite, and fell ass over elbow into the water. Kevin's dad flew almost a hundred feet before he landed in a tree. Unfortunately, the tree was already burning from a brush fire started by Percy's smoke. So it toppled over, sending him through the roof of the nearby hillbilly shack, where he was beaten and sodomized for hours. That was the kind of thing that would have upset most men, but because Percy had been in and out of prison so many times, it was pretty much business as usual. A few hours later, Kevin found his dad in a nearby ditch. And that's what fishing's all about, boy. Come on, let you and me find something more fun to explode. Now! Take the wheel, Kev. I got some blowing up to do. Hard left, boy. Don't throw no boo. Sweet. Oh, dear. <laughs> 